She's recording. So welcome back. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Welcome back. <laughs> Tattoo talk with Cat and Cat. Yeah. We're, what are we, Riley, what are we talking about today? Mental health and work-life balance? Yeah. Do you know what work-life balance means? No. Cat? Okay. It's like this kind of an ironic topic. It's an ironic topic for me. Absolutely. I don't know what that is. I kind of, I was gonna say, I kind of love it. I have so much respect for you because you work so hard, like out of anyone that I've ever worked with in this industry or as a whole, like the dedication that you have to the craft and like it's an obsession and like you go home, you have years worth of flash, like you're constantly like months ahead and you just yeah. would die on the, on the hill for the industry. Like I would die on the table. <laughs> die on the bed. Um, so this is how I go. <laughs> but yeah, like you're uh, just obsessed with it. And I, I think it's amazing. Um, it's not a balance, though. It's not. So I feel like that's, yeah, the segue. It's into... never been a balance for me, though. Like, I would love to. Mm, I'm getting better at it. I'd like, I gave myself a week off this year. I agree. I mean, <laughs> no, that's... You guys yep. give me Christmas break and I was like, oh, I guess I could take another week vacation. <laughs> but we'll be in here tattooing on Christmas though. Like, I mean, that's just... I might not be. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah? Yeah. Well, we'll update you and see if that's actually the case. I might go to Montreal and guest. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's yeah. No, yeah. Even when I was on vacation, I was... I tattooed on vacation. Mm -hmm. And I was visiting a tattoo shop every day while I was on, I, I have a problem. There I mean. is no work life balance. Yeah. yeah. Has it always been like that? Um, yeah. Like pre tattooing though, too? Like that's just your care, like your personality? I, your... Yeah, I like to work. Yeah. Um, but tattooing, it's a lot easier to like to work. Oh, and you love what you do. It's so Yeah, different. I love what I do. Yeah. So, yeah, like I come home at the end of the day and even while parenting i'm still like mentally preparing for drawing mm -hmm. and like the second the kid's in bed i'm like back to the drawing board just zoned in yeah that's like how old were you when you started working like what was your first job i think i was 13 when i got my first job it was like a babysitting thing because is it 14 you legally can or thir something like that like, like as soon as you could kind of thing as soon as i could i started working yeah and i've always when i wasn't working it just wasn't well for me like mentally right um yeah no i've always been working where was we were at like a fast food restaurant or like grocery store my first one i worked for a christian bible camp <laughs> what? as a problematic catholic yeah it was great um that was my first job, like my first paid job. Oh my, I did not know. Yeah. Please tell me more. Well, let's talk about cults. <laughs> Wait, what is this? Because you're from down south. This, this is in Brampton. Brampton, okay. Brampton. Um. So, yeah, but I guess I didn't, like that was my first, yeah, ever paid position. And then we made the move to Hamilton when I was in grade like 10. And then okay. I got my first job. Oh, I guess it would have been grade 11 for me. I got my first job. It was like, yeah, fast food, Wendy's, mm. working at the Cineplex. I worked a bunch oh, of nice. call centers. That's what like the huge thing okay. is in Hamilton was working for call centers. Yeah. Um, And then, yeah, it was like, that was when I first started getting tattooed. Because mm. I made good money sitting mm -hmm. at a desk all day. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting tattooed and I was like, hello. Shit. <laughs> and then did you... Well, you didn't work during your apprenticeship because you were actually on a mat leave. Like you just had a child. So like, did you have another part-time job or that you were doing that full-time? No. So I was bartending up until I was seven months pregnant, almost oh, eight wow. months pregnant. Okay. And then, um, yeah, I had my daughter in June of 2016 and I started my apprenticeship August 2016. All right. Damn. Yeah. That's a good time to do it. I mean, if you can, like that's... Yeah, I That's had great. all the I had my mat leave saved yeah. up from yeah, bartending yeah. and then just yeah, five working five, six, sometimes seven days a week until now. And then the hustle began. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my the hustle began. Yeah. Wow. And it's long days too. Like I know 
um, like actually tattooing on skin may not be as long as no. some other people's, um, you know, traditional length of a work day. But we go home, like you're like, we go home, we design, we're constantly thinking about it. Yeah. In the morning, we wake up, we're preparing, we're doing our stencils. Like it's so much more in depth than I think people realize you're constantly researching or getting concepts yeah. or, you know, like it's like the shop opens up at noon, but what time do we actually get into the shop? Like 1030. Exactly. Um, and yeah. The drawing doesn't like I've actually gotten onto a schedule now. I shouldn't call it a schedule, but like where I'll draw from like oh, I was gonna say eight until ten thirty, but that's a lie. Like mm -hmm. I was drawing until like midnight last night. Yeah. That's but I'm funny. caught up for the year. I have all my drawings for the rest of the year. For the entire year. Okay. That's nuts. That's great. You know how many people do them the night before every night? Like that they're the I would be unwell. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I i can't i can't fuck with that um there's definitely days where it's happened but i try and be a couple weeks out but i've yeah. never been till the end of the year like that's that's amazing yeah but i'll still like i revisit it like every mm -hmm. night even though i'm caught up until christmas break on my drawings shit i, saw, I like into january <laughs> yeah. for my drawings every night i will still go back and go day by day through the calendar starting tomorrow and my work my way back through and I like finesse all my designs I will take yeah. away from and redesign mm. on every single one wow. until the appointment date. Wow. So it's never, I'd have never finished. Yeah. No, that, that's and then I'm like, let's come up with some more flashed. <laughs> you always are coming up with new flash though, which is nuts because you've been tattooing for so long. So how do you come up with new concepts and new inspiration? You know what I mean? Like that's... Well, everything I draw though is like organic. It's always yeah nature related yeah or like reproducing mm. um like famous works mm -hmm. like my like I you saw those flash sheets I started the other day where I was like <gasps> I'm gonna pull back from like my photography career and I pulled out yeah. all my like favorite I shouldn't say famous photographs because they I guess they are famous photographs but photographs that pushed me further into the industry mm -hmm. where i was like i i always wanted to like recreate them in photos but now i'm like why can't i just like tattoo the imagery so sad so that would be fun i love those the face that's like dividing sorry if i'm like sh if you haven't shown it yet but it's no, like, the middle them. face and then like the two faces that are splitting looks unreal like, yeah it's i've been playing around with like yeah mixing portraiture with um like ceramics and statues mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so that's fun it's beautiful thank you so with the industry and how busy it is i know that after the pandemic we tried to not book out as far so we close our books we're not booked out for a year and a half anymore like we try and only do three months i know it's more than three months right now just yeah it is what it is but um when you're booked out super far does that kind of stress you out more because you feel like you have to have everything designed or like what does that look like when you're more booked is no it no it's better just because like like i would be more panicked if i didn't have any bookings next week Oh, okay. You yeah, know yeah, what I yeah. Mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, for sure. When I, if my bookings are out three months consistently, yeah. if one person cancels, then I'm like, cool, I have that opening, pull someone else in there. Yeah. Like, I like to gauge where I'm going to be financially, but that's also on anxiety and like trauma. Okay. Where, like, I don't know. I don't, I would never want to be booked out any more than five months. Yeah, it's because mayhem. You can't do anything. No, like, you can't plan a trip or do anything and then you're yeah. like rebooking people and i found that i found that very stressful like i feel like we're at a good medium right now post pandemic for sure post yeah because i felt so bad i mean riley was rebooking three to six months at a time but and then having to do it again because we would get reopened and then you have to rebook everyone and yeah. then we'd get closed and then we'd re like, three different times or yeah. i don't even remember i'd try to block that like out we're but... still doing financial catch-up from the pandemic oh yeah i just sent 20 grand i have to send another 20 <laughs> But They're that's like, just the part of business, right? The government's right? Like, like, hey, let's help you out, but... You have to give me it back. You have to give me yeah. your money back. And you're like, fuck, yeah. I can't get ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Had we been down south, though, we would have had to close. Well, we any would really business. Shop, absolutely. Like, And it's, you know, we're in a fortunate position that we live like in northern Ontario and it's... At the time was affordable. It's not so much affordable anymore. Yeah. Um, But had we been paying rent in, say, downtown Toronto... That's insane. There's no way we would have no, been able would to have float. Shop. That's crazy. So yeah. we're fortunate in that way. And I mean, it's just a yeah. part of part of business. You right? have a great work by work life balance, and I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I do now. Now that yeah. I have you know, I have people that I can lean on and I can delegate, and I have that support yeah. system. It definitely wasn't always like that. No, well, it was just up until 
four years ago, it was just you. Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, it was, I mean, it was, it was the grind. Like I started tattooing when I was, when I was 17 and I became obsessed with it. And I always, for most of my career, I had another job. I had like serving or I had something. While like, tattooing? While tattooing. Yeah. I did portraits on the side, sold artwork. Yeah. Um, the entire time I lived in Toronto, I, for the first year, no, six, nine months, I was tattooing full time and then the building burnt down. Right. Yeah. So I lost all my equipment. I didn't have anything. Um, and I, and I didn't have resources to go and be like, Hey, buy me this equipment back. And I was also kind of bullheaded and I wanted to do everything myself. And, yeah. you know, so even if I had the opportunity, I don't think I would have let, you know, see like a parent or someone buy my supplies back. And it's not cheap. Like your no. tattoo setup's very expensive. So yeah. got a job serving and then, yeah got back into tattooing i probably was off for like six months i had to save up really yeah yeah it was about six months there i didn't tattoo because i didn't have any equipment Ah. Uh. yeah but and then i stayed serving um you know part-time the entire time i was in toronto while tattooing full-time and that's how i was able to open up when i got home yeah. um and then when i got home obviously i just i, I tattooed full-time and and then yeah, when we grew as DTC, I was able to not work so much because my mental health was taking a big struggle because of personal yeah. um, issues. And I was like, I just physically couldn't. Like, I was so unwell for, for a period there. And that all kind of went around the same time as the pandemic, which we all dealt with differently. But yeah. it was something that hit me really hard. Thankfully, I found oil painting. Yeah. And that kind of put me in a different trajectory. I had an outlet and I really like, I become obsessive with things. And I think, you know, you kind of do too. We have that in common where like we really hone in on things and it can bring a lot of success, but it can be like, where's the balance, you know? Yeah. So I think that's like a constant struggle of like trying to find that obsession where it's still a healthy outlet and not becoming so fully consumed in it that you're using it as a distraction and you're not facing your actual issues that are going on. You know what I mean? Where mm-hmm. it's like, you're yeah. just clouding everything with this one thing that I'm going to hyper fixate on because then I don't have to focus on what's going on over here, or over here. And I can kind of push that to the side. Yeah. I'm so that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm happy with the balance that I have now. Um, but there's, there's days where I'm like, fuck, I, I want to be at the studio every day. Like I love it okay. here. And then when I was sick a couple weeks ago, and I just take like four days off of work. Like I was so depressed. Yeah. I love like this is like. you couldn't even paint when you were that sick. Well, no, no. So you didn't get either one of the things that bring you joy. Yeah. Yeah. So that can be really hard if you don't have that. that outlet. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have art. Um, yeah. And I think all of it really coincides. I think that there's a lot of mental health within our industry. There's a lot of addiction. There's a lot of self-medicating and stuff that goes on. Yeah. Um, I don't want to speak for anyone at the studio, but I don't think any of us have really dealt with that super deeply, but I don't know people's stories, but yeah, we, we, we don't deal with that now anyways. Like no, we're all I think pretty much more, sober, which is like I was going to say we're all sober. Yeah. Um, which is very nice because when yeah. we all like, we all kind of decided around the same time that we were going to kick like poor habits. Yeah. And aim for sober living which was really nice because we all have each other as like a support in that or yeah like there was a time I want to say it was just like before I started at DTC and then probably into the first like eight or nine months I was at DTC I was definitely like self-medicating and not in a good place but that was on you know I was I got divorced right when I moved at to DTC yeah and it's just yeah there's been so many changes in the almost four years that I've been with you Mm mm-hmm So like a lot of changes. (laughs) So yeah, um, it's been very interesting. I do like that we're all on that sober kick right now because it's been very nice to like not feel like um, like when we're hanging out and stuff or if we go out anywhere, there isn't that like pressure to Mm -hmm. indulge, I guess. Yeah, to like overconsume. Or overconsume, which seemed to be um, an issue, at least in my past with like either who I was around or dealing with like the stressors from work. Yeah. So it's very interesting to have like a sober shop. Yeah. I, you know, even just going to conventions and seeing how the industry conventions are not a lot of celebration. Yeah. Is going on. <laughs> yeah. A lot of celebration and yeah. a lot of the events that are um, like tied to 
um, conventions are always at a bar. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like... Everyone's socializing. Everyone's like, socializing. You want to make the you yeah. want to make the connections and do the networking, but it always seems to be around like an after party because we're yeah. you're at a convention till late in the yeah. evening, and then it's. I yeah. did an after party once, like yeah. one of the conventions I did in like 2019, and I was like, "Guys, we just worked the convention for 10 hours, and I'm sorry, we're we're going to a bar now." <laughs> like, yeah, was wiped. Yeah, and I don't just sets you up for failure the next day. I don't think I've ever tattooed hungover. Like I've never been a drinker to begin with. Yeah, but I don't know how people do that or no, like all strung I don't out. think like I've that would. No, I don't think I've tattooed hungover either because I tr- I like try not to. But I also find that's like a weekend thing, and we like don't work on weekends where we yes. aren't lucky. Yeah, but also like I always think of like street shops that are open until late at night. That yeah. deal with like clientele that have been drinking mm-hmm. or like when they're done their late night shift that they'll go out and drink and then it's like almost gives them that leeway to come into work the next day hungover because generally tattoo artists don't start until late has mm-hmm. always been something where I'm like, fuck, I don't know if I could. You don't want me tattooing you at 9 a.m. I'm not functioning. Like I'm awake. Like I'm I'm awake, but like I don't want to be. I'm not functioning. I'm not, something I'm permanent. <laughs> No, no like I'll get up and I'll do my parenting stuff and I'll get the kid to school and <clears throat> take the dog to the dog park, but I'm like showering and getting ready for work at like 10. Yeah. And then waddling, in. waddling in with my coffee and then the day gets started. But I mean like 12.30 to 4.30, that's my prime. Mm-hmm. You want me in that area? Same. Anything before or anything <laughs> after? I'm like, I'm delirious. And I think that that goes with like we need that downtime and even if we are using the downtime to draw and stuff like it is a very all-consuming like you're so honed in when you're doing a tattoo even if you've been doing it for how long like it's very it can be very stressful yeah you know and that weighs on your mental health that weighs on your well-being and um I think we're all pretty fairly good at acknowledging when we're down and we need time and we all communicate so well with each other and we're such a good support system which is I mean I couldn't have asked for more like i i just think it's it's very much a rare thing um and i don't think some people even get to experience that in their lifetime to have that kind of support group and yeah how many jobs i I don't know how many jobs i've had in my life and working with women is has always been tasking because i'm like yeah we're whispering (laughs) we're talking very intimately (laughs) hey i will yell (laughs) um yeah, where it's very interesting to have we curated this group. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and it just I feel like the universe backed us. It was like, you know, cuz it at no time was it like, oh, we are specifically um an all-female non-binary studio. Like that was never the intention. It just happened. And yeah. I feel like we're kind of marketed that way or people just assume that that was purposeful. It wasn't. No. Like we'd hire <clears throat> a guy. We've interviewed oh, that one guy was such a sweet. We have we've we have, yeah. We have. It's not something that we're against. It's just worked out very beautifully that we found a group of women and non binary folk that do jive together really well without mm-hmm. any sort of drama. Mm-hmm. Which is rare. For sure. And it just I've never questioned anyone's intentions. I've never been like oh you know are they i know we all have anxiety and we worry that we all hate each other but we all love each other but it's like in that sense of like i i know at the end of the day we all have each other's backs there's no like bullshit that goes on behind closed doors like it's just literally very nothing. love i know and if, like walk in the door and it's like what's wrong yeah like we just read each other really well which is incredibly helpful to have that space where we can just be ourselves without judgment And then also have, like, that nice little support level to lean on, which has been great because, like, we're all also in therapy, which I think is a a great thing. Mm -hmm. You love therapy. I love therapy so much, but it's it's a form of therapy, though, because when you have people that know you so well and you can truly be yourself and not feel like you have to mask or, you know, feel shame because maybe you aren't the societal norm or Mm -hmm. anything like that. It it really helps you be able to be your authentic self. And I mean, how exhausting is it to try and mask all day or to try and be something that you're not? And I think everyone that works there, you know, we've all experienced that at some point. Like it's, yeah. And, you know, I think, 
my my perspective on friendship has you know changed from the time I was in high school or you yeah. know and like it's you're constantly evolving and I, and I used to have this like massive group of friends and I still love all the people anyone that I've been connected to but it's like I, I don't need a hundred friends mm-hmm. I have a handful if that of really good ones and that's all that I want like yeah I, that's great it's it's just so rare and I think that a lot of people don't genuinely experience it um and it just I don't know where I would really be without it and I think I've become I'm more myself than I ever have been oh for sure and it's I don't know that I would have fully gotten there without the support that I have from the you know the love that we have at uh at DTC yeah like it's mental health is is an interesting one I feel like the stigma has gone down like I feel like it's changed a bit like a it, little we live in a small city though so I feel like as, as a whole it's definitely changed and as much as I'm like yeah talk bell day and all that kind of stuff which is like a big corporation I'm not shitting on it but like a big corporation just looking to kind of have yeah I'm I have my qualms with that because you can it's the same thing with corporate pride you know oh yeah we could go into that for sure <laughs> yeah um, where yeah you can't just put a face on for like 30 days a year and be like we're gonna raise all this money and then just not speak to it for the rest of the time mm-hmm. um yeah it's a lot it is it is a lot but i it makes me um Emotional because I, I know everyone for the most part struggles on some level, but a lot of people feel so alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you have a group of people who are so open to talking about, you know, who they are, what they're dealing with and to like understand what that means and what that looks like and how you can support one another and explore what your own needs are in terms of support. And um, I just I feel like so many people live with trying to just please everyone or yeah. you know what I mean like it's I don't know yeah I don't think I realized what struggling with mental health was until it like slapped me in the face and then I was like oh that's what people mean or yeah yeah I think you see it a lot in our industry I don't know why specifically um it's always because uh, I don't want to say it is absolutely because of having like an artist's brain is different, right? And just growing up, generally being told that you need to like strive for like a real career, something that'll make you money. And then being told yeah. like when you're taught in school that basically like the large artists never made money in their life. And that if they had, um, like the, the, their mon- their fame and their money would be coming to them now kind mm-hmm. of thing where it's like fed to you that being an artist is just like it's a hobby it's not a career it's um I don't know it's just one of those things where like even when I got into tattooing family was like oh so like you can make money doing that like that's that's your job like why don't you get a real job I'm like this is a real job mm-hmm so I feel like, it, um, I don't know, it, it seems to be a lot of like marginalized groups <laughs> yeah. become the artists and then you're already facing whatever discrimination prior to, and then you're just, uh, I don't, I don't know how to put it into words. No, but, you don't, it um, makes sense. Like groups flock together, like like-minded people. Yeah. And then yeah with the industry with like drinking drug like drugs and alcohol and stuff like that has been um i don't know it's just like uh, i don't know the word it's like a precursor kind of for what it's always been um that doesn't make sense either i don't know the words right now it's i mean i i can definitely relate to like what you're saying with you know like the um, when you started as an artist and kind of like societal's view on that and I mean I've definitely shared my opinions on in in, in that regard but I can remember when I'd I'd moved home and I was you know gonna start like tattooing full-time 
again back back in my hometown and one of my family members being like oh like that's really great but like what are you gonna do like for money like full time and like, and like both of their kids went to school and they had like these good jobs and stuff and i was like it's well, a costly industry in itself like the equipment costs money the inks everything is so expensive like where do you think i'm drawing the money from anyways i'm it, pulling the money out of doing the work and not to be like it's it's monetary value sure it's great and not to be like you know to whatever but i i made more than both for kids i was like but it's not about that i don't care i don't care yeah. about that I, I love what i do and to me that's more than any sort of big paycheck or you know being able to to gloat about that it's it's waking up loving what you do and being able to provide for yourself too like, yeah it's that that whole that whole abundance together but I just hope the next generation has that support. And not to say that I I didn't like my I mean my my dad's been amazing. Um my my family's pretty good as a whole, but society I think is more of an issue when in terms of when you're in school and they ask you what you want to do. Like I feel like I only had four options. I feel like it was like be a teacher, be a nurse, be a cop. Like it was those mainstream Yep jobs and when you go against the grain and, and you do something that's a bit different you kind of have people looking at you or like they're like surprised that you then end up being successful yeah that and they're like oh you're thriving <clears throat> yeah mm -hmm. like we're in a recession i'm still here <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> like but and you know and then that's something in, in itself where it's like okay so we want to have this appearance we, we are thriving we are doing well but then you have the mental health and wanting to be transparent we want to change the stigma so we want to be open and talk about it but then i don't want people to look down on me and judge me and think that i'm not doing well because they don't think i'm mentally stable yeah. and then they're not going to believe in us as a business or as a business owner yeah. fuck those people if that's their opinion but that is a very real reality mm -hmm. you know in like the fine art career like in, in in that way you want people you want um galleries to invest in you you want collectors to invest in you are they going to do that if they're worried about your well-being as a mental as your mental health yeah but yet the most successful artists were, were so fucking, mentally ill. Fucking insane. And they produce the most beautiful art. Like it's, that's the groundbreaking stuff is when it's so raw. If you look at other genres, if you look at music, if you look at yeah. um, even interpretive dance, like there's so many, I mean, film, like a lot of it is from those really raw, vulnerable places of people being like, this is my experience. This is what I'm feeling. This is who I am. And yet they kind of get judged on the back end of it yeah. and they're not successful until they die. Yeah. And it's like, oh, what a struggle and this and that. And they, they'll never actually see their their full potential. And, and, I, and I hate that it's always brought down to monetary value and like what you sell because that shouldn't matter. It's what you're creating and if, yeah. and if you love it. Yeah. But it's... Money isn't real. <laughs> not really. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It isn't. I um I I do love seeing other entrepreneurs and other people in business like like ourselves that that are open about you know um maybe if they're on like an SSRI or they're in therapy or like they're showing a video of them crying because they're going through something yeah. or they're talking about their well being and their mental like there's a few that I'm not going to name names but like that come to mind even locally which I'm like this is so huge the more people that can talk about their struggles and be vulnerable and then it makes other people feel like they're not alone because yeah, they feel seen because it's yes. just like i am not alone because like look at this person they're still like they're struggling the same way well not the same way but like it's relatable they it's don't relatable yeah. yeah 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 when i was doing that that project um and i had so many people apply for the mental health project to be interviewed and it was I, I don't like the word normal or average, but it's people that you wouldn't have expected. And, yep. you know, growing up, I had a bit of a sheltered life. Um, not that it was very privileged, but I, I didn't really see mental health the way that I do now. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, my my perspective at one point was that you would visibly be shown mental health, but it, it's not always that way. And no. it's some of the most, you know, societally viewed successful people that struggle so deeply. Like who, um, there was that... I mean, there's a list of people who have taken their own lives that you would have never expected because mm -hmm. um, they actually are struggling so much. But on the outside, they have what everyone wants, wants or it's yeah. like that envy of, you know, always comparing to the bigger thing, the next thing. And I think that, you know, circles back to our industry and um, it being so competitive and 
it doesn't need to be because everyone's being fed. Yeah. But yet we're so hard on ourselves. Like I would say that you and I are our biggest, like I'm my biggest critic and you're your biggest critic. Yeah. Perfectionism is going to be the death of me. It propels us forward and you're so fucking talented and I hope you know that. But that's, <laughs> but that's what continues to make you grow and continue. But it's like, where is that balance at the end of the day? Yeah. Because it weighs on that's you. What, that's why we love therapy because I have to put my perfectionism in a box and hide it in a treehouse hidden behind a moat in a secret door in a library that yeah. nobody else can access but me. But I have to put it like very, very far away. Yeah. And every once in a while I have to do my little perfectionism check-in, but then I have to like reel it in again where I'm like, I, I, I've talked to you about it and I've shown the girls that where I'm like, you're looking at a tattoo and you're like, we scroll through Instagram, you're being fed so many artists in your face every single day. Mm -hmm. I don't want to tell everyone to do this, but the nice little zoom in mm -hmm. every once in a while, because I could be so obsessed with it, like another artist and every once in a while i just have to like do the little zoom in and be like oh, that line isn't perfect <laughs> like, <laughs> even they fuck up yes because yes. i will when i'm working on something i will pick away at every finite detail yeah of a piece until i am in tears and it is not a healthy way to go about doing it but that's just my brain right um so yeah <laughs> it's perfectionism is is a, probably the hardest one to deal with like outside of just like uh where right now in our industry you need to be on social media they mm -hmm. want reels you can't even post photos to instagram anymore it's not going to catch traction they want to see your face they yeah. need they want the visual of you setting up your station tearing down doing your little stencil reveal fucking foam wipe <laughs> I hate it. I hate it all because then it just makes you feel like you're not adequate because you're not doing everything that these million other people are doing yeah. online. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. You do you. I'm not of that generation. Yeah. It doesn't work for me. Um, I don't know. It, like, yeah. It's like everyone having access to you whenever everyone they want. having yeah. access yeah. to you whenever they want is yeah. a big deal where I'm like, God, damn it, would I be thriving as well if I didn't have Instagram? Or is that where the industry is going now, where we have to be posting to TikTok? We have to post mm -hmm. to Instagram. You have to post your reel. They want you on. We weren't meant no, to consume no. that much information. So of course, we're going to be sitting there nitpicking at ourselves yeah. when you have a million other great artists slammed in your face on it, on the daily. Mm -hmm. And then like, how do you propel yourself forward from there? Mm-hmm. It's um, it's a lot. Are you? You don't have to answer us if you if you don't want to. Um, I mean, obviously we can take our podcast wherever we want. <laughs> um, like, when was the first time that you self aware realized that you were struggling with mental health? Oh, over the course of thirty five years. Let's see. <laughs> Um, I, uh, when I realized something was wrong initially and mm -hmm. then eight or nine years old, really young. Okay. Um, when it hit me that there was options for help, Twenty four, twenty five. Oh Oh, wow. That's a big, that's a big gap. An 80s baby. Yeah. That stuff gets pushed down so fucking fast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're just a little quirky. Yeah. No. No. My brain ain't right. That's fine. I feel like you deal with it very well, though. I feel like you're very self-aware. I'm self-aware self now, but that's on therapy, mm -hmm. um, years of experimenting with different, um, yeah, SNRIs, SSRIs, antipsychotics, whatever. Mm -hmm. And now getting to a place where I'm realizing a lot of my mental health struggles are a um, like a correct reaction to what was like um, the way I was brought up, um, abusive relationships, mm -hmm. masking was a huge one um not realizing that i am very well have like autism and ocd and 
whatever else. Just like it, it's a lot, but what, coming to DTC, <laughs> so it's been almost four years. Mm -hmm. The amount of progress in that short period of time has definitely helped. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've progressed again, like more than I think anyone I've ever witnessed in such a short time. Like actually we all have like Riley, like it's yeah, yeah. the growth that's happened is like, is so incredibly inspiring. The self-awareness, the, the looking within and like the, you know, you're like just so vulnerable to be like, how can I help myself? How can I reflect on this? And what other, you know, um, whether it's, it's therapy from, a psychotherapist or it's meditation or it's exploring spirituality or just being mm -hmm. vulnerable enough to like open up those old wounds and try and do what you can to mend things or just to yeah it was yeah it was just a, like a lot of that where it was like why doesn't the square fit the circle yes yeah and like drawing connections of like my childhood this is why i respond in this way this is why yeah. i have this coping mechanism um things that you don't realize that connect it do that shit blows my mind in therapy and i love it like yeah. it's just like there's so the different uh, the different gateways of like gifted kid to the next to like pipeline yes and mine was like gifted kid to addict <laughs> you know yeah so yeah um yeah, self-awareness was a big one. And then also being um, like where we spoke to it before about how we like curated this group of people that really mesh well together and are very accepting of each other, where I was able to unlock shit from like years prior where I was like, oh, I was literally masking that whole time, trying to fit the bill for something that I wasn't because I was told that's how I should be based on X, Y, Z. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, just coming full circle into being like, oh, and a lot of that was identity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Big changes. <laughs> it is. And it, like, it, it's making me emotional because I, I've, I'm so, I'm so proud of you and I've seen like how much strength you have and how much you've come into that place. And I know that it's always an ongoing journey, but yeah. it, it's, it's given me the confidence to be like looking at myself and to do my own growth and it's just it's it's a fucking lot like and it to be so you know we're in a small city and people have opinions and whatever but none of that fucking matters because you have to be happy with who yeah. you are at the end of the day yeah they have their opinions and they'll continue to have your opinions and i know people don't like me and that's fine <laughs> i don't know anyone that doesn't like you cat Ooh. and if they do they can go fuck themselves like I, yeah, oh, fair man. enough. Yeah. A I, lot yeah. of people would love to just, you know, it's fun. It's fine. Um, I don't care to be liked. I just want to be understood. Yeah. <laughs> if anything. But it's hard to be understood when you don't understand yourself. And that's fine too. You're getting to a point where it's okay. I don't want to cry. I think that you, understand yourself more than you ever have and then the people oh, that yeah. are around you understand that too like you're saying like you just listed how many things that you ex that you uh learned about yourself in such a short period right yeah. like you're you're more cat than i've ever known like it's like it's so beautiful oh, to watch yeah. and i like, you know it's I'm hard at the point it sucks that it took till like between 30 and 35 to be like holy shit i've been like living a lie but it's also it's those i don't know it's the path fuck it the is. path but it's the path i'm on um but yeah it's hopefully going to help <laughs> career wise it's definitely helping artistically yeah that's amazing oh for sure now i'm snotting everywhere it's great you look beautiful but i i also think it's you know, it's it's important when when we're willing to be so vulnerable like you are right now. And it's because there, there's people who, if we like it or not, that maybe look up to what we're doing or to maybe they want to be a tattoo artist, they want to be an artist, but they feel like they can't. And if they're dealing with anything that you're describing, then they're like, oh, shit, maybe I can, you know, like it's, yeah. it's nice. We all struggle. We all have our shit, right? And people just like to pretend that they don't and... I think it's um, huge when people can be 
so like forthcoming like it's fucking not easy though no because there's our world is very shallow and loves to um project and a lot of like you know any of the hate that we've gotten not that it's we're very loved our clientele is amazing i'm very proud of the city we live in yeah um but there is some people regardless of where you live that are gonna shit on you because they're they're envious of where you're at or it's they're dealing with their own insecurities and it's all a projection with them that it actually has nothing to do with us yeah maybe they wish that they could be living the lives that they think that we are but no one actually knows no one knows shit no they they like to think that they do which is i mean i guess human nature but fuck those people like, yeah <laughs> yeah i remember um someone had said something about me and usually i don't i mean i don't even pay attention half the time but I, I had come up in therapy and my therapist was just kind of smiling at me and she's like, she's so incredible. And she was like, well, like, think of that for a second. Like, do you ever hear people tearing people down that aren't doing something? Like, yeah. in, a, in a sense, it's a compliment because this person, I, I mean, I, I don't know why they said what they said, but it was either they were envious of where I'm at or yeah. they were doing their jealousy. own thing and they're looking at me. And it, it's, it, it is what it is. And yeah. I'm not, not to say that it, people should be feeling those ways about me i i'm just trying to figure out who i am and live my own life and be an artist but to try and deal with that and instead of getting mad at that person and you know try and take it out on them it's like okay well at the end of the day what are what are they going through and it really doesn't have anything to do with me no and it didn't and it, right like it's it's just the mind is very <laughs> complex and i try and take that into consideration um when if anyone is ever being overly um, critical of other people's lives it's like okay well like what trauma did you go through or what are you dealing with that you haven't really faced that yeah. is making you judge that person or you know be so critical of the way they're living is it because you want to live that way and you were told you can't from societal norm because of your childhood or whatever that reason is yeah. or are you, are you just so strong and whether it's a spiritual or religious belief or mm. you, you know what i mean like there's so many reasons why someone could be that mean and cruel yeah but I, I no one's born like that no one's born a mean person no, malicious it's, like it's, it's learned not, behavior it's environment yeah. it's it's upbringing it's their own mental health too and I, I hate i really don't like when people use it as a crutch knowingly no do you know what i mean like there's that line of like oh i just did it because i'm so i'm have this diagnosis or whatever and it's like that's mm -hmm. valid but sometimes it's not if you are self-aware in that moment and you're like oh well i can do that because i can get away with it and say do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's, yeah, there's always that fine line there. Um, not to say that I'm the one who can dictate that. I'm definitely not, but no one, no one's perfect. And, um, I just, I wish everyone would stay in their, in their own lane sometimes. <laughs> it makes it sound like we have like these like big enemies and we don't like where mm -hmm. I just, I just mean in general, like I, I think most people can relate to that. People yeah 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 for people sure. love to make assumptions yeah and that's fine they can assume they just make it what what is it makes an ass out of them it does and i um <clears throat> even when you know there was i think i've maybe i've said this on the podcast before but i had um, an artist who attacked me personally um they called me a fat cunt <laughs> And told me, to, told me to go back, back to where to you where came I'm from, and I'm which like, is I'm, here. I'm from here. Thank you. I'm back. Um, but I didn't. Thanks for the I, welcome. Home. I didn't respond. I didn't do anything. And people were sending it to me. And they're like, oh, blah blah blah. Like, and I was like, it, that just is a reflection on that person. I'm mm -hmm. not bothered by it. Like, you you can have your opinions of me. You can think I'm. I like that I'm. I have fat on me. Like, that's fine. Yeah. Um. But at the end of the day, and then anytime I'd see this person, I'd go up to them and try and be like, hey, how's it going? And they would just gun it. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like, what am I going to do with that? I can't control what someone else is going to say or their perception of me. Yeah. You can talk shit. That's going to make you look bad, in my opinion. Yeah. So if someone wants to, like, I don't know what the meaning is behind. Anyways, it's just. Lovely. It's people. People are who they are. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a fucking journey. What time is your tattoo coming in? In one thirty. Oh, we got time. What else we can we talk time. about? I feel like we could really dive into. We could. We're talking about mental health. <laughs> um, no, I think crying is such a beautiful release, but. I cry all the time. You know. I so hard not to. Oh, it's such a good release. I know, but then I'm like. 
constantly like, oh, I'm so sorry to my client, or I'm like, I'm just having, I'm crying into you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> when was the last time you cried before right now or before today? When did I cry last? Yesterday, probably. <laughs> did I cry yesterday? I cry. I'm a high, highly emotional person. I cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cry over random shit, but I, I'm very yeah. much someone who gets in their head a lot. And that's on me being my biggest bully where I will nitpick and sob or take one thing someone says five years ago and just ruminate on it until the end of time. I had someone say that um, poor mental health has no place in the tattoo industry and I wanted to fight them so hard because like, oh, wow. have you seen folks that are tattooed? <laughs> have you met a tattoo artist? We're not well. <laughs> like wow, okay, that's a that's a statement. You can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen, kind of person. And I'm like, yeah. So they're probably the most actually suffering deeply. Whoever said that, because yeah. they just can't deal I'm with their like, own shit. Man, I wish I could live on that pedestal that you put yourself on. That you feel so fucking great every day. That you can do no wrong. There's that arrogance and that living in a shadow and in our community specifically because it's so small we have this website that's called keep the sioux safe we were from sioux st marie and um northern ontario and it's like i think it was built with good intentions but it's gone in a way of such hate and such judgment and like the most triggering words and i i apps i don't want to say these words but like when people say the words like junkie or crackhead or um like homeless and it's just like done with in a way of of pure ignorance and oh, sometimes i fucking hate how smaller city is and everyone just thinks that they know what's going on in people's lives and there's like there's so much there's so much judgment and misunderstanding with people who struggle with mental health and addiction and our community is absolutely flooded with it and it's so tragic yeah it's an epidemic and it's hitting seventy five thousand people on the daily and i i wish i could be i don't wish i could be but i wish i could just be unaffected by it it's unattainable like it's just i'll even have a client in my chair this doesn't happen very often because i definitely i i don't like confrontation but it's definitely something that i will correct but if someone will say like oh how do you like living in the area or they'll say something about um someone who's without a home or who's struggling with addiction and they just use those trigger words or that you can tell that it's coming from that place of judgment and you're like Oh, well, that must be nice to have that perspective that you've never been touched by addiction or you've yep. never had to deal with that because that's like what a what a fucking privilege that is to say that you don't even understand what that's like. Yeah, that it's just like an inconvenience for them to have other people around them that are struggling. And it's always, yeah. Oh, well, you're in the hood. How's that going? Yeah. Well, like, well they don't want to help themselves. No, they literally can't. A lot of people cannot. are so um deep in struggling with it with their mental health that they aren't their reality is so much different than ours that they are unable to make certain decisions that to you or i or to whoever that person is that has that judgment is be like oh well just don't do that or just don't do that Th that's not a rational it's not approach you think that's gonna fix everything and it's it's not i just some of the language that goes on and it, it just absolutely breaks my heart and you know i've 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 people in, in my family who like deeply struggle with mental health and addiction and it's just it's so hard to watch and I remember something had happened like one of the traumas that I had experienced in my life and it wasn't even my trauma I shouldn't say that because then it's taking the it's, it's lessening my trauma which my therapist says I shouldn't do anyways when you like compare it to someone else and you're like well theirs was worse but you know a lot of people knew what had happened because of the city we live in and it's so small and someone came up to me in a very public place like two days after and they were like oh how is so-and-so the person that ha that happened how are they doing and i knew that they were asking me because they're looking for gossip and tea i'm like why are you asking me how this person's doing you know what happened and then i i ignored it and i didn't really say anything and i just like kind of ignored the conversation and then they said well oh so-and-so said that they saw them and i was like so you know how that person's fucking doing why are you asking me yeah you want me to cry right now? Do you want me to tell you that they're struggling deeply and they tried to harm themselves? Like, I don't know. 
if people just don't know how to navigate those types of situations or it's coming just from a place of wanting to know all and it's so yeah I have so much to say about it and it's so hard to like I think people just need to be more kind I think people just need to be nicer and I'm not excusing some of the behaviors that go on in our world but a lot of the times such horrific things happen because our system fails people. Our system is failing everyone daily. Like you go and ask for help and it's like, or say like you get someone arrested under the mental health act, you go to a JP, you go through the whole process and then they're let out the next day. And you know, the, how many incidences where people have gone to the emergency room being like, I don't feel like myself, I need help, I'm going to harm myself. And then they're, they get let out. And then the next day they end up killing themselves or they hurt someone else. And it's yeah. like, I'm not saying that that's okay because it's not okay. And I feel so bad for the victims of when things happen. But if that person tried to get help and if our system actually fucking helped them, maybe that could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. Maybe if the doctor, I remember when I was, so I have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. And when I was going through my therapy with my GP, not my therapy, but going to my GP and be like, hey, my therapist says that they think that I that I have this, but she can't diagnose me. She's yeah. not a psychologist or a, or a psychiatrist. Um, my, my doctor had sent me as a referral. It took five months to see the person. Mm -hmm. And I had an interview for maybe 40 minutes. And then they, I left with four or three different scripts. I didn't take yeah. any of them. I'm not, if you need, I think medication is beautiful. If you need to take it, you fucking take it. But I have such a, you a leave hard scripts, relationship. But no diagnoses and no action plan. Yeah. I wasn't like, here are the alternative options. And I have so, I'm so scared of drugs because of the trauma related yeah. to drugs in my life. And I'm, that's why I've never done hard drugs. I'm terrified of them because I've seen what it can do to people's lives. So I didn't take any of them, but I'm like, what are my fucking options? You go in and it's like, Hey, help me. And they're like, Oh, here, let me give you a bunch of drugs goodbye where's the therapies where's the other th where's the meditation yeah. where's the diving in and it's it's not just a band-aid and i am again i'm not shitting on on pharmaceuticals in that regard because they are fucking needed yeah but i i never ended up taking any of those i've taken like um you know out of van yeah and i can see why people like that shit holy fuck <laughs> <laughs> um, but microdosing literally changed my life i did the exposure therapy which was amazing like yeah. it was the hardest thing i've ever done but that really got rid of my night terrors and all the really hard stuff that i was dealing with it still happens but i'm able to process it in a different way now but microdosing did so much for me and i'm completely off of it now yeah, i wish i, I was to able I to be on it i need to get on that train it's it's great but i just feel there, if our healthcare system didn't just say, here, take all these pills, those pills can work and be very useful, but we have to heal the under underneath trauma of, mm -hmm. of why we're dealing with this. Or if it's a chemical imbalance, let's balance that chemical in the brain with yeah. whatever it is that's needed. But let's also do the back end too. You know, I feel like it's, I don't know, I'm not a medical professional. I shouldn't no. be trying to it's say just what people should do. It's easily brushed off. And yeah, unfortunately- because of what big pharma is, that's always going to be the first plan of action. And because doctors get the kickback from that. Well, then it's like, oh, okay, that's done. We don't have to deal with this anymore. That was an hour. Bye. Yeah. See you in how long so we can up your script. And then I can talk to it from the other side of it as someone who has struggled with addictions that when the first thing they do is throw another pill at you. Mm-hmm you become fearful of the pill because like whatever pills they give you because of your experiences with someone else on that end. But then when you're handed a bunch, a series of medications that also come with underlying complications and um, like side effects that just trigger what got you into that addiction in the first place yeah. makes it even harder to follow through with your little antipsychotic regimen, you know, like, mm -hmm. <sighs> You don't want to self-medicate, but you also don't want to medicate because either one can go any of which way in a like a poor direction for you. It, it's it's really messed up. Um, it's a never-ending cycle, right? It's fucking like a brains, door. brains, and the world. <laughs> <laughs> but like, <laughs> like it's not taking right. your brains out, putting them on ice, yeah, and moving to Mars. 
Jupiter? Where would you want to go? Venus? Mars is burning. Is it? I not? like it hot. Ugh. Where would you? I don't want to go to another planet. I just want this planet to magically be fixed overnight or just let's change implode. This one. Okay. Just it can just implode and take all of us. You know, we've yeah. already gone through what five stages of instinct and extinction already. Let's just phew. what's another one? That's fucking nuts. The world's on fucking fire. Everyone's doing stupid shit. She do be hot. Should be heating up. I shouldn't joke about that. Like global warming is happening and global warming and more wars. I yeah. can't. Oh. I can't. I don't even want to take that on mentally mm. anymore. I can't fucking read the news. I can't. No. I'm. 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 I'm playing ignorant and not reading the news because if I have to take on one more thing that's going to uh, uh, make me cry, where I can't do anything to fix it, I don't know. Yep. Call your MPs. Okay, I'll call yep. my MP. Mm -hmm, for sure. I will call my MP. I will do a stand-in. And um, where does that get me? I don't know. It still doesn't help anyone. It's – I don't watch the news and I was visiting with my in-laws and they very much love the news. Um, and they were talking about the don't say gay law in Florida was on the news and I was just sweating. And I like – I it's fine. Fuck Florida. Sorry. Oh, oh my god. No, I'm not going there for Christmas. Like don't. I'm not going. Don't. I'm like, do I never go to Florida again? Like, no. Which is such a bullshit thing to complain about. Okay. The Florida stupid. man already was a, a reason not to go to Florida. Oh, no. I know. Um, <laughs> But now that you literally – no. No, yeah. like even we're looking into my last vacation where we made a list of all the countries and places in the world that are safe, yeah. quote unquote, as queer and trans folk and coming up with really nothing and then being yeah. like, cool, I am neighboring like five minutes to a state that they have open like discriminatory laws where you can be kicked out. Mm -hmm. of like a hair salon of uh, you can be grocery shopping and be kicked out of the grocery store for presenting queer mm -hmm. i will say canada putting out the uh, state of emergency oh, or not a state of emergency, like a travel advisory but, but the to travel the united advisory states for anyone right when um, they queer. sent that to us i was like bye michigan hi yeah. i'm looking at you right now yeah. but like bye see you never like yeah. i'm not fucking going there yeah i thought that was great that canada did that though yeah, but usually Canada it's very, like, in itself nice. is. Well, I know Canada shit too. Um, no, I mean, yeah. You know mm -hmm. what? It was just Remembrance Day. We'll just <laughs> you wrap it up, Ryan. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there, twelve minutes is when their appointment is. We are always on time. You know, some tattoo studios make you wait for hours. They don't show up. Not that that makes it so that we don't have to. To be continued. I'm glad you're here. It's a nice mug. We're glad you're here. Okay. Suicide awareness. Oh, is that what it is? That's mm -hmm. so, that's fucking that's great. Yeah. Hmm. I'm on that shit. I would be so fucking mad at you. You can't be mad at me if I'm not here, bitch. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should not joke like that. Trigger warnings all over this podcast. <laughs> Trigger, yeah, like a disclaimer. It's all from a place of love. I um, like to joke about my mental health. We all do. Like in the amount of times that are like people will be like, I'm just going to kill myself. Like I literally start sweating every time someone says that. I'm Me like, giving everyone toaster bath no, bombs. No, it's just like. I remember the toaster bath bombs? I was like, hey, we're all having a bad year. Guess what you're getting for Christmas? I Did I not give you a toaster bath bomb? I no. swear to God. I, um, yeah, see, you wouldn't That's, have taken it as well no. as everyone that like makes me want to that's and i know that it's a joke and it's like a, a self-soothing and it's a way of coping but like that's my coping me people, mechanism people kill themselves all the time and it's so real and it's like fuck i know it's so, it's heartbreaking. so real i've lost many people oh i know you have and i've lost many people and i've been in positions myself where i'm like the fuck yeah um yeah. it's just heavy it's heavy uh life sucks i like to joke about it and i'm sorry no oh my god I'm gonna try. Guys, you can joke about it if you want <laughs> Just because I'm a little bitch about it doesn't I'm mean you can't joke about it. I'm trying to be less morbid. No, I like your I like your sense of humor. Oh, I'm glad you think it's. I funny. do. It's good. It's funny because we're very very different people. Yeah, we but are then, very different from but, each other, but then similar in a lot of ways, and like yeah. we get along so well. And I'm assuming that's from my perspective. <laughs> it's like get me the fuck off this podcast. Love you. Exit speech. Uh. Okay. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you for dealing with us and my tears. <laughs>